very good afternoon to sri lanka medical association uh, i welcome all of you to the monthly clinical meeting this is actually the final clinical meeting for this year and will be conducted in collaboration between sri lanka medical association and ceylon college of physicians and uh, this clinical meeting is mainly focusing on acute and chronic liver failure and there will be interactive case presentations and the uh, the thematic discussion as well as the slide presentation on a quiz and uh, to start with the clinical meeting i would like to invite uh, dr ag karyavasam who is senior registrar in medicine national hospital sri lanka and dr tuwakaran pobal singham who is a registrar in medicine of national hospital of sri lanka they will be starting with the case presentations and case based discussions over to you good afternoon everyone I am Dr. Dwarakan Pobala Singham, Registrar in Medicine in HSL, representing Ward 47B and 49. And uh, today, uh, to begin with, we are going to start uh, discussing a case uh, about a young man with distended abdomen. Before I begin, I would like to thank Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving us this opportunity, and my uh, senior registrar, Dr. Tilini Kariyavasam, and my consultant, uh, Dr. Ganesha Aliana Rachi, Madam, for uh, their guidance and encouragement. So our patient uh, is a 40 year old motor mechanic who presented with worsening of abdominal distension for one week duration. And he also complained of fever for three days duration and yellowish discoloration of eyes and generalized pruritus for last few weeks. Uh, if you go into the history of presenting complaint, uh, he also complained of dark urine but uh, he denied any pale stools, abdominal pain, or change in bowel habits. There were no neurological involvement such as sleep reversal pattern or confusion. Uh, he had adequate urine output without any urinary symptoms. There was no history of shortness of breath, cough, or any respiratory symptoms. And uh, there was no chest pain, orthopnea, or PND, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And, uh, there was no past history of any chronic comor comorbidities such as diabetes or hypertension. And uh, there was no past history of blood transfusion, high risk sexual behavior, illicit intravenous drug abuse, or any long term consumption of Ayurvedic drugs or hepatotoxic drugs. And uh, there was no history suggestive of hemochromatosis, such as sexual dysfunction, recent pigmentation of skin, etc. And there was no history of suggest, to suggest Wilson disease as well, such as neuropsychiatric manifestations or any symptoms of Parkinsonism or chorea. There was no history suggestive of autoimmunity, no history of recurrent episodes of diarrhea or any constitutional symptoms. And there was no family history of liver disease or consanguinity, no history of, of any surgeries involving biliary tree or any drug or food allergies. And... Uh, if you go into the history of alcohol dependency, he was using alcohol for past 10 years, 30 units per day. Last alcohol consumption has been three weeks prior to the admission. Uh, and uh, in changing of behavior, he was in the contemplation stage and uh, he exhibited evidence of tolerance to alcohol and he was unable to cut down or stop or stick to drinking limits. And he denied any withdrawal effects uh, but he accepted that he had strong desire and compulsion to drink alcohol. He denied neglecting alternative pleasures or interests because of alcohol consumption. So according to the uh, ICD-10 criteria, he fulfilled uh, the criteria for alcohol dependence. And uh, he was the breadwinner of the family, father of two children and a motor mechanic. Uh, with uh, He was economically stable. And on general examination, he was febrile, mildly pale, deeply ecteric. There were no peripheral stigmata of chronic liver disease. There, was, uh, there were no constructional apraxia or hepatic flaps. And uh, there was constructional apraxia and hepatic flaps. And uh, there was bilateral pitting ankle edema as well. And uh, on abdominal examination, abdomen was symmetrically distended with no dilated superficial veins. Abdomen was non-tender. There was no clinically palpable organomegaly. The abdomen was tense with a fluid tray. 
and the cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurology examination was unremarkable. Uh, so in summary, uh, our patient was a 40-year-old man with no significant past history, presented with a complaint of progressively worsening abdominal distension for over one week duration. And, a three day, and three days prior to the admission, he developed low-grade fever with no other symptoms suggestive of any focus of infection. He has noticed yellow discoloration of his skin, skin and eyes together with generalized itching, which preceded these presenting symptoms. He gave a history of long-term long -term heavy alcohol abuse with dependency. Uh, and uh, the physical examination revealed a young man who was febrile to touch, pale, deep lecteric with bilateral pitting edema. There were no peripheral signs of chronic liver disease. He was conscious, rational, but with constructional apraxia and asterixis. The abdomen was symmetrically distended and was non-tender. Clinically, there was tense ascites with no organomegaly, and he was hemodynamically stable with no abnormality in the rest of the examination. So if we move on to the investigations, uh, the full blood count initially showed uh, leukocytosis with platelet of uh, 128, which gradually came down over days 4, 7, and 14. Then uh, later on, uh, the patient went into pancytopenia with leukopenia, anemia, and thrombocytopenia worsening. And then uh, by day 30, he recovered and uh, the WBC was 6.63 with HB of 9.9 and platelet of 160. And uh, renal function test serum creatinine, sodium, and potassium was normal throughout. Uh, initial blood picture showed neutrophil leukocytosis suggestive of bacterial infection or inflammation with acanthocytes and a microcytic anemia with mild thrombocytopenia, uh, which was evident of liver pathology. And uh, later on, when uh, he developed the pancytopenia, we repeated the blood picture. We showed pancytopenia with macrocytic anemia, again suggestive of liver pathology, without any evidence of maha or hemolysis. And uh, these are the summaries of uh, summary of uh, the liver function test and the PTINR. And uh, ASTs and ALTs were elevated with, uh, uh, but uh, they remained uh, remain stable throughout. And uh, there was total bilirubinemia with significant increase in the direct bilirubin fraction. Uh, and if you see the total bilirubins and direct bilirubins both increased uh, gradually throughout his ward state. ALP gamma GT uh, rather remained uh, within the normal range except for few values. And uh, there was a uh, reduction in the total protein with uh, uh, serum albumin being 2.7 and 2.3. And uh, later on, as we replaced albumin, his albumin level increased. And INR was 1.8 to begin with, which also raised towards, uh, uh, raised during this, uh, his ward stay, it was, uh, 2.6 by day 10 and 3.86 by day 30. And uh, we did an ultrasound scan abdomen which showed a coarse uh, liver echogenicity with irregular outline with portal velocity of 7.7 .7 centimeter per second. There were no focal liver lesions, no intrahepatic or CBD duct dilatations. Uh, and there was splenic enlargement with splenic varices with mild to moderate ascites. So in conclusion, there was evidence of advanced chronic liver cell disease with portal hypertension and mild to moderate ascites. And uh, the CECCT abdomen showed, uh, again, decompensated cirrhosis of liver, and uh, there was no focal lesions or focal liver lesions or portal venous thrombosis, but uh, there was significant portosystemic shunting was observed, and uh, there was evidence of moderate ascites as well. So uh, the peritoneal aspiration was initially done on 22nd, uh, about seventh day of his hospital admission, then later on repeated again as we treated him with intravenous keftraxone. Initially, it showed evidence of uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis with pus cells of 252, and uh, it gradually came down. And peritoneal culture, nevertheless, uh, never yielded any growth. And uh, upper gastrointestinal endoscopy showed small esophageal varices without any red signs. There was evidence of portal hypertensive gastropathy. 
and uh, other investigations such as alpha uh, fetoprotein was normal ana was negative immunoglobulins levels was normal anyhow the anti smooth muscle antibody became as positive uh, and uh, hepatitis screening was negative retroviral studies were negative and uh, for course evaluation we did iron studies and serum seroplasmin level which were also uh, within the normal range so these are the problems that we identified in our patient uh, so there was acute on chronic liver failure which was precipitated possibly by alcoholic hepatitis he had spontaneous bacterial peritonitis rapidly filling ascites grade 2 hepatic encephalopathy and uh, we had a man uh, with a newly diagnosed cirrhosis fairly a young man uh, and he also had alcohol dependency so now i would like to uh, invite my uh, senior registrar uh, dr tilini karyavasam to discuss uh, how we managed uh, this case good afternoon to all of you and thank you dr twarkan for presenting our patient so our patient is an ordinary patient that we very frequently come across in our day to day practice but then why did we select this topic to discuss because this type of patients are very frequently neglected in our wards having a chronic organ failure does not mean that there's nothing that we can do for them therefore the sole purpose of this lecture will be making the management of this common disease more familiar to you so at the end of dr twarkan's presentation we will conclude that our patient has acute on chronic liver failure so first let me discuss how we manage our patient in the ward so when he come to us came to us we diagnosed him as having acute on chronic liver failure and the most probable cause for his acute deterioration in his liver failure we but we were able to figure out was the possibility of alcoholic hepatitis but when he present to us he had uh, there was evidence of uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis so in the presence of an infection although the specific treatment for alcoholic hepatitis is with steroid we were unable to start him on steroids therefore first we treated him with appropriate antibiotics and when he was out of infection then we started him on steroids and with these uh, treatments when he was uh, he gradually came out of the acute uh, deterioration and at the same time he was having evidence of hepatic encephalopathy as well for that we provided him with the standard medical care with lactulose and other uh, standard medicals medical care and also when he was coming out of this infection he gradually improved and the main complaint which he made which made him to seek medical advice was the rapidly filling ascites so for this he received uh, repeated sessions of large volume paracentesis and with each session he received albumin replacement as well and once he was out of hepatic encephalopathy we started him on diuretic therapy then when he was coming out of the acute problems still there were certain issues that we had to attend to as dr twarkan clearly pointed out our patient had all the criteria fulfilling for the alcohol dependency this of course is a major problem with regards to his management because if he continues to drink this will further damage his already damaged liver and also the specific treatment for his chronic disease is going ahead with liver transplantation but if he is not coming out of with this alcohol dependency then we can't proceed with it therefore we referred the patient to the psychiatrist to a psychiatrist and there he received a formal psychiatric assessment and appropriate counseling with which he agreed to give up his drinking then again this young man who is the sole breadwinner of the family having young kids who were dependent on him was diagnosed as having cirrhosis so we can't let him die of cirrhosis 
we have to do something. So for the definitive treatment is transplantation. And actually when he came to us, there were criteria fulfilling for liver transplantation. He came with acute on chronic liver failure, which itself carries a poor prognosis. And also on admission, his prognostic scores were high. And even after treating him for about one week, there was no improvement at all. So uh, unless he undergoes the transplantation, he will not recover. Therefore, we referred him to the transplant team and started him on transplant workup. So that is how we manage our patient in the ward. So making this a learning opportunity, I would then discuss about the management of acute on chronic liver failure and also the uh, co common complications of acute on chronic liver failure and their management. The man uh, this will include the management of ascites, renal failure in acute on chronic liver failure and also bacterial peritonitis. And for my upcoming slides, I will use two main references. One is the Asian Pacific recommendations for the management of acute on chronic liver failure and also the European guidelines for the management of decompensated cirrhosis. So when it comes to the management of any organ failure, first we have to assess the severity of the disease. When it comes to liver disease, liver, uh, chronic, acute on chronic liver failure, there are multiple uh, models that are given in various, various guidelines. But out of them, for Asians like us, the most suitable uh, such score is AARC score, which is recommended by the Asian Pacific uh, study, uh, group for the study of liver disease. And this score is a very good prognostic model and it can be used to assess the severity. And uh, also it was well validated and it was compared to multiple similar scores and found to be superior to most of them. So let's see what this AARC score is. It is a simple score composed of five uh, components, four uh, biochemical tests and a one clinical parameter. The four uh, biochemical tests include bilirubin, INR, lactate, and creatinine. The only clinical parameter is hepatic encephalopathy. And each of these components will be given points ranging from one to three, depending on how severe each of these component is deranged. More severe, they will receive more points. So at the end, we have to calculate the cumulative value. So this will range in between five to 50. If it is within five to seven, then we, 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 we can grade it as mild disease and a score between eight to 10, it is a moderate disease and severe disease means a score of 11 to 50. So then let's see how, can, how we can uh, make use of this score in our practice. So once a patient comes with acute on chronic liver failure, initially we calculate this score. If it is less than 10, this indicates mild to moderate disease. So this, of course, has some good prognosis. So what we will do is we will start give, uh, 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 we will give him the standard medical treatment and if available, regenerative treatment. And actually this score is a dynamic score. Therefore, we have to repeat this, repeatedly assess the patient again and again. So when after treating for some time, we have to reassess the patient. When we reassess the patient, if there is any significant improvement, that means if there is a reduction of the score by at least two points, this indicates that there is good prognosis. So that we can have a good hope that there is a possibility of recovery. So in such patients, there's no hurry to go for liver transplantation. We can just observe, but anyway, we have to closely follow up there. But in case, if they are worsening, then we have to consider liver transplantation. But on the other hand, suppose there is no uh, significant improvement with our standard medical treatment. So that means the chance of spontaneous recovery is very low. 
In such a situation, rather than waiting, we have to consider early liver transplantation. So when the patient is awaiting liver transplantation, we have to give the organ support and bridge therapy. Bridge therapy I will be discussing later. And if the score is initially very high, this indicates severe acute on chronic liver failure. So in such patients, anyway, they have poor prognosis. So for these patients, we will decide on whether we are going for an early liver transplantation or not, depending on the involvement of other organs rather than the liver. So if the extra hepatic organ involvement is less than is none or less than one, these patients anyway, we consider as having a good, good prognosis. And there's a possibility that if we go for liver transplantation, they will recover. So for these patients, we will offer early liver transplantation. But suppose if they have, a, uh, have other organ involvement more than two. So for these patients, again, we provide them with the organ support and brief therapy and reassess them on day seven. If there is significant improvement, again, we can have some hope. So for these patients, we will again offer early liver transplantation. If there is no such improvement, that indicates that the chance of recovery, even if we proceed with liver transplantation is very low. So for these patients, we will just offer supportive care. So that is how we will consider, consider the definitive management depending on the prognostic score. Then uh, for the acute on chronic liver failure, first we if possible, we have to find out the possible uh, cause for the acute deterioration. If we can find out such a cause, we have to treat that. For example, if the patient's deterioration was due to active viral hepatitis, for those patients, we have to treat with antiviral treatment. And if it is autoimmune hepatitis or alcoholic hepatitis, where steroids are effective, those can be treated with steroids. So likewise, depending on the cause of the acute on chronic liver failure, we have to treat specifically. And other supportive care also is necessary. There are multiple treatment modalities we were, which were tested in clinical trials, out of which albumin was found to be very effective, according to the clinical trials, in treating such patients. And these patients carry a very high mortality risk. And this is supposed to be due to multiple complications that occur during the process. Renal failure and sepsis are the most common complications which are, which are very commonly associated with acute on chronic liver failure. So periodically, we have to check for these complications and where necessary, they should be treated appropriately. And however, the specific treatment is liver transplantation. And as how I have already mentioned, early, yeah, the better if we are thinking of liver transplantation, we have to go ahead earlier. And also when deciding on liver transplantation, we have to consider about the organ, invo the organ involvement as well as the scores in liver specific dynamic scores. And there are some newer therapies that are recommended in acute on chronic liver failure. But before describing them, I will just uh, describe the underlying pathophysiology of acute on chronic liver failure. As we know, the liver is the main organ which detoxifies most of the chemicals and toxins that are produced in the body. But in chronic liver disease, we know that uh, endotoxins produced by the gut bacteria, they bypass the uh, hepatic circulation and enter the, uh, enter the systemic circulation. And these can give rise to an inflammatory response. And the as in the inflammatory response, there are chemokines which are produced. These are also usually removed by the liver, but now the liver is failing. So that these cannot be removed from the body so that they get accumulated within the body. So as a result, it acts as a vicious cycle. It causes on going on inflammation, causing multiple damage to the other organs as well. So we have to break this cycle. But to break this cycle, we have to re-establish the ac action of the liver, mainly the detoxifying action. But unless we go for liver transplantation or 
uh, if the liver uh, recovers spontaneously, unless it happens, we can't break this cycle. So as how we do in renal failure, in renal failure, uh, we provide hemodialysis. You are familiar with it, where water soluble waste products are removed from the body by a dialyzer. So in the same way, in the liver failure, albumin bound toxins are removed from the body using a dialyzer. This is what is called liver dialysis. And these are the bridging therapy that we use until we are ready with liver transplantation to keep the patient alive by giving the, uh, uh, the functions of the liver to a machine. And for countries like us, where our resources are limited, plasma exchange is also a very good modality to give over the detoxifying action of the liver. And in specific conditions, such as Wilson City or severe autoimmune disease, these uh, therapy with plasma exchange will be more useful. And granulocyte colony stimulating factor or GCSF, which was tested in multiple clinical trials as a regenerative therapy has been also found to be very effective in treating these type of patients. But it is not included in any of the guidelines yet, but we hope that it will be included in incoming, upcoming uh, guidelines. And then uh, let's see what happens in the portal and systemic hemodynamics in acute and chronic liver failure. In studies, it was found that these patients who are coming with acute and chronic liver failure have a very high uh, hepatic venous pressure gradient when compared to those having just decompensated cirrhosis. This is supposed to be due to severe hepatic inflammation that I have already described that is going on in these patients. And when it comes to portal hypertension, it has two components, irreversible component, which is the structural damage due to fibrosis. But we are particularly interested in the reversible com component because that is where we can intervene. So this is due to the hepatic inflammation that goes on in acute and chronic liver failure. And this causes a rapid development of severe portal hypertension. And this development of portal hypertension is the reason for multiple complications that we see in acute and chronic liver failure. They include variceal bleeding, uh, development of rapid onset ascites, and also other systemic complications, including organ failures. So ascites in acute liver failure is a result of acute portal hypertension. Uh, ascites, they have three grades. Grade one is mild ascites, which is only detectable by ultrasound scan. And grade two is the moderate ascites, where moderate symmetrical distension of the abdomen occurs. And grade three ascites is the large and gross ascites, where there is marked abdominal distension. So when it comes to the management of ascites, any patient coming with ascites should undergo a diagnostic peritoneal tap or paracentesis. So there we are particularly interested in knowing the neutrophil count in the ascitic fluid because it gives us the idea whether the patient is having the possibility of peritonitis or not. And then each and every of these samples should be sent for culture. And it is recommended that we have to send, we have to inoculate these ascitic fluid into blood culture bottles bedside. And then again, the, uh, the total protein concentration of the ascitic fluid is also very important because this can be used as a predictor of the susceptibility of the patient for development of peri uh, uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And in case we are not sure why this uh, ascitis is developing, whether it is to decide on whether it is due to portal hypertension, calculation of the serum to ascitic fluid fluid albumin gradient is also important. And in case if we think that this acute deterioration is due to hepatoma or any other malignancy, we have to look for cytology aspect. Then let's see how we can manage large ascites, that is grade three ascites. For large ascites, we have to offer large volume paracentesis. 
As the name implies, in this process, what we do is we remove a large volume of ascites with an aim to remove all the ascites in a single session. So it is large if we remove about at least more than five liters of ascites. But if we remove that much of fluid from the body, it will definitely cause some circulatory problems. That is where this complication, the paracentesis induced circulatory dysfunction occurs. So to prevent that sort of complication, we have to replace the fluid amount that we remove from the body with an appropriate fluid. So the recommended fluid for such replacement is albumin high dose. Even if we are not removing that much of fluid where the fluid amount is less than five liters, still albumin is recommended. And once we come out of ascites, we have to start the patient on diuretics, starting with the minimum dose and then gradually increase. And when we are dealing with, patient, with the patient with ascites, we have to avoid certain medications such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aminoglycosides, and also angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. And moderate restriction of sodium is also recommended. And uh, there are multiple complications that we anticipate in such patients out of which renal failure is one of the common complications. So this is also supposed to be due to ongoing inflammation. So when managing renal failure in acute on chronic liver failure, anti-inflammatory strategies also have a good place. There, albumin as well as N-acetylcysteine also has a place. And we have to come down with, with bilirubin and also have to avoid any nephrotoxic drug and to prevent renal failure, we have to maintain a good circulatory volume, maintaining a good mean arterial pressure so that the kidneys will be properly perfused. And where necessary, we have to go ahead with renal replacement therapy. Again, the next killer in these patients are, is sepsis. So generally sepsis occurs around seven to 15 days. Therefore, we have to keep our eyes open and we have to frequently screen them for such complications and where necessary, we have to treat with antibiotics. Then spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is also a complication of acute on chronic liver failure where it is a clinical diagnosis, but still the presence of uh, neutrophils more than 250 per cubic millimeter in the ascitic fluid is supportive of such a diagnosis. And where we, if we are uh, suspecting spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, we have to start antibiotics empirically as, uh, without any delay. And it is third generation cephalosporins that are recommended in such patients. And the duration recommended is with about five to seven days. And again, here also albumin has a role. It was shown that it has a good, uh, it has, Albumin administration has a good role in preventing complications such as renal failure. Uh, when we, after starting antibiotics in these patients, we have to reassess the patient clinically as well as with a second paracentesis. So in the pa second paracentesis, we expect a proper reduction of leukocyte count where it should be at least 25%. So if there is no such a reduction in leukocyte count or if the patient clinically does not show any improvement, this indicates treatment failure. But uh, any patient who develops spontaneous peritoni bacterial peritonitis are at risk of developing the second episode. So they should be started on secondary prophylaxis. And since it carries a very poor prognosis, for these patients also, we have to consider early liver transplantation. And secondary bacterial peritonitis. There are certain clues that we can get from the clinical as well as a lab test to point towards a secondary bacterial peritonitis over spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. They are, if the uh, cytic fluid culture grows more than one organism, that is suggestive of secondary bacterial peritonitis. 
And also if the uh, cytic to neutrophil count is very abnormally high, or if the protein concentration is also very high, that also suggests the possibility of secondary bacterial peritonitis. And if there is a treatment failure of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in such patients also, we have to consider secondary bacterial peritonitis. And in case if we are thinking of secondary bacterial peritonitis, we have to consider CT scanning as well as if appropriate surgery promptly. So then let me summarize. In the management of acute on chronic liver failure, the use of specific dynamic scores is very important. And the AARC score is a very good prognostic score that we can use in the management of such patients. So liver and liver transplantation is the definitive treatment for acute on chronic liver failure. Uh, when it comes to management of ascites in acute on chronic liver failure, this is due to the severe hepatic inflammation and the treatment, uh, we can treat them with large volume paracentesis. And during these sessions, we have to replace albumin. And acute kidney injury and sepsis are common complications of acute and chronic liver failure. And periodic screening for such complications should be done. And spontaneous bacterial peritonitis carries a poor prognosis. Empirically, antibiotics should be started on suspicion of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Patients should be commenced on prophylactic antibiotics following successful treatment for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And in case if we are thinking of the possibility of secondary bacterial peritonitis, we have to consider CT scanning and surgery promptly. So that comes to the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. And now my consultant, Dr. Mrs. Uh, Ganesha Liena Rashi will talk on about uh, the pathophysiology and other uh, about the acute on chronic liver failure. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, topic for the day is acute on chronic liver failure. So actually, the concept of acute on chronic liver failure uh, is not a new one. Uh, this had been there uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, but uh, up to date, there's no consensus. Uh, uh, definition uh, among specialists uh, and uh, the European uh, recommendation uh, to diagnose the acute and chronic liver failure is uh, uh, different uh, to that of the um, Asia Pacific recommendation but personally I thought when I was uh, looking through all the recommendations uh, the uh, recommendation given uh, in the uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, group is more ap applicable to our setting. Uh, so my presentation is uh, mainly based on the consensus recommendation of the Asian Pacific Association for the study of the liver, that is APAS. And uh, uh, this acute on chronic liver failure is a, a major medical problem uh, worldwide. Uh, the management is challenging, especially because of the uh, it's acute uh, presentation, uh, uh, rapid clinical course, and uh, mostly the associated uh, very high short-term uh, mortality. Uh, so the main aim uh, of today's uh, discussion is to raise the awareness about this concept of acute on chronic liver failure. Uh, so we will start with the basics. And uh, while we are talking, I think uh, most of the things Tilini made me very easy. She gave a very uh, the, uh, extensive, in-depth uh, discussion regarding the management of the acute and chronic liver failure. So we will see uh, the liver carry out uh, many essential functions and it works with a reserve. So whenever there is an insult to the liver, the, uh, the liver functions will start deteriorating, but the reserves come into the work. And uh, at that point, uh, you, we will not see any clinical manifestations, and this is called a compensated state. Uh, when the re uh, reserve is overwhelmed, 
uh, the clinical manifestations of uh, liver failure and decompensation appear. This graph is also uh, summarized the same thing. Uh, green line is for normal liver, blue line is for the compensated cirrhosis. So you can appreciate that uh, normal liver is functioning with the optimal uh, reserve and the uh, compensated cirrhosis is uh, uh, functioning with suboptimal reserve. So whenever there is an acute insult, uh, liver functions will start deteriorating and uh, when it uh, go beyond the level of threshold for the hepatocellular failure, uh, the individual will start showing uh, uh, liver failure or decompensated um, uh, features. Uh, then if we uh, act appropriately at around this area, uh, we will be able to reverse the liver function. But if the uh, liver functions deteriorate further and go beyond the threshold for recovery without liver transplantation, we won't uh, be able to reverse the um, uh, race. Uh, so, and you can appreciate well, these decompensated cirrhosis patients are starting uh, below the uh, threshold for the hepatocellular failure. So they are already having symptoms, signs and symptoms and with the acute, on, acute insult, uh, their function will deteriorate rapidly uh, towards the threshold, uh, below the threshold for the recovery and the prognosis is going to be uh, poor. Uh, so uh, this picture actually summarizes uh, the uh, liver failure is a, a spectrum of disorder, uh, it ranging from the acute liver failure uh, to the uh, end stage liver failure. Uh, then depend on the, um, uh, with the acute insult, depend on your uh, baseline uh, liver function uh, reserve, uh, the, they have identified four distinct uh, clinical entities. Uh, the, uh, the first one is the acute liver failure. So if your liver reserve is normal, then you will present uh, uh, with features of acute liver failure. The pa uh, individuals having chronic liver disease uh, will uh, present uh, with acute on chronic liver failure. Compensated cirrhotic patients will present either with uh, acute on chronic liver failure or acute decompensation. The already decompensated patients will uh, present with further worsening and in stage uh, liver failure. So we will uh, quickly go through uh, each uh, uh, roughly without going into detail uh, because of the time constraint. So acute liver failure happening in the normal liver, it will lead to coagulation abnormality and a degree of encephalopathy. This is a medical emergency. So now we'll concentrate on what is acute decompensation. So acute decompensation is happening in patients with cirrhosis with or without the uh, prior decompensation, though this could be the first presentation or uh, repeated event. And um, within three months of hepatic or non-hepatic insult, uh, they will present with ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, or acute liver, liver uh, acute variceal bleeding, singly or in combination. So this will follow uh, the jaundice. It will be a very mild jaundice. If you check uh, total serum bilirubin, it will be less than five milligram per deciliter. Now we'll concentrate on our topic today, that is the acute tone chronic liver failure. So to diagnose acute tone chronic liver failure, uh, it should be the indexed first presentation. So it's uh, once in life we are diagnosing and the patient category is uh, chronic liver disease patients or cirrhotic patients who are not, uh, uh, has had any decompensation previously. The acute insult is a hepatic insult and they will present uh, with initially with jaundice and coagulopathy. Here the jaundice is uh, uh, seems to be generally a uh, severe form of a uh, jaundice. If you check serum bilirubin, it will be more than 5 milligram. And later they can develop uh, ascites and encephalopathy within four weeks. So interestingly, other feature is that they are carrying very high uh, short-term mortality. Uh, then we will just uh, see the difference between uh, acute decompensation and acute or chronic liver failure. Uh, it's very difficult in clinical setup uh, to differentiate these two groups and uh, the management wise uh, both we are managing in similar way all the uh, precipitating factors and all the complications but prognostifier in in prognostifying we uh, it's important uh, to uh, differentiate 
both together. So if we summarize acute decompensation, we are diagnosing in patient with cirrhosis with or without decompensation. Following the hepatic or non-hepatic insult, they will present with the ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, or varicell bleeding. Later, they will uh, develop jaundice. In contrast to that, acute uh, chronic liver failure patients are uh, the group of patients who are having chronic liver disease without prior decompensation. Following acute hepatic insult, they will present with jaundice and coagulopathy. Later, they will get complications like as ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, uh, so on. Uh, so we will just uh, concentrate a little bit uh, what is chronic liver disease in acute and chronic liver failure. Uh, so this is in a form of cirrhosis or chronic liver uh, disease. And etiologies, they have identified commonly the alcohol, hepatitis C, B, O, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Then uh, diagnosing the chronic liver disease in a patient who is presenting with acute or chronic liver failure is a bit uh, difficult uh, job, but uh, we can use uh, the bedside simple tools like hist history, physical examination, uh, recent and available uh, laboratory endoscopic or radiological investigations. Generally, ultrasound scan abdomen, CT abdomen are very sensitive tools, non-invasive tools we can use to diagnose chronic liver disease. But uh, patients who are having acute or chronic liver failure due to the inflammation and as they are in the liver failure, sensitivity of these uh, uh, non uh, invasive uh, um, uh, investigations are a bit low, so ideally we have to go for a liver biopsy, but it's tricky in this situation because uh, they are carrying very high risk of bleeding. Uh, so if you are doing a liver biopsy, we have to uh, choose the transjugular liver biopsy and histology. Uh, so um, yeah, this decision uh, should not be taken uh, very uh, lightly. We uh, if appropriate, we have to go for multidisciplinary team approach. So here, uh, doing a liver biopsy, what we are trying to uh, gather is the if we don't know the cause of chronic liver disease, so the acute insult, or if we want to grade the, uh, uh, assess the fibrosis, uh, then uh, we can consider individual cases for the uh, liver biopsy. Uh, then acute insult, uh, common acute insults, they are take, uh, they have identified as alcohol. And uh, again, the, uh, the hepat uh, hepatotrophic viruses and uh, mainly uh, other than that drugs, autoimmune diseases. But interestingly, 5 to 15% uh, of the patients, uh, we won't be able to identify uh, the acute insult. So here I have summarized what Tilini was giving uh, uh, in detail, uh, the acute on chronic liver failure is a state of uh, acute inflammatory response, which will um, uh, which will trigger systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And uh, out of that, uh, small percentage will uh, recover. Uh, they are the inflammation will resolve uh, on its own and they will recover. But majority of patients having persistent inflammation and they will go into a stage um, compensated anti-inflammatory inflammatory response syndrome leading to sepsis and uh, followed with the organ failure. So. Uh, the other main thing I want to highlight is there's a golden therapeutic window uh, with uh, the acute insult uh, uh, till uh, developing the sepsis. So it's uh, one to two weeks, the initial presentation. Uh, so this diagram is also uh, summarizing the same thing, but I uh, would like to show you that this is the window period, therapeutic window with acute insult, uh, they will develop the systemic inflammatory response and liver failure will get gradually deteriorated and extra hepatic organ failure start a little bit late. So this is the therapeutic window. So as I said earlier, the Asia Pacific uh, 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 definition catches patients very early before they are getting the organ failure. Uh, but uh, Europe, according to European definition, they have included organ failure also as a part of their definition. So they are diagnosing patients a little bit in late uh, stage. So in our setup with uh, a bit low resources, better to diagnose early. That is why I thought uh, it's better for us to go with the Asia Pacific definition. Then sepsis also 
the co common and it's happening in the first week uh, so we have to actively look for that uh, for that uh, we should know how to diagnose systemic inflammatory response syndrome uh, so uh, if we can uh, find uh, two of the following uh, we can diagnose systemic inflammatory response that is altered temperature tachycardia tachypnea and altered uh, uh, blood count and the sepsis is a consequence rather than cause for the acute and chronic liver failures. What are the common uh, infections we will see are bacterial infections, but uh, invasive fungal infections are also not uncommon. So bacterial infections uh, we will see uh, in a form of uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, urinary tract infections, pneumonia. So we have to uh, look into these infections actively. So routine in investigations are warranted. Right now, we will rush through uh, the, the organ dysfunctions uh, in acute or liver, chronic liver failure. I will mainly concentrate on uh, kidney and the brain. Uh, so, kidney, uh, the, uh, the, this is uh, kidney injury in acute or chronic liver failure is multifactorial, and uh, the single serum creatinine levels will uh, not be very sensitive because of the uh, liver failure. Uh, so here they are um, advising to take the dynamic changes of serum creatinine and urine output. So there are uh, several uh, criteria and guidelines. Out of that, uh, the critical uh, staging is more appropriate, I thought. Uh, so they are uh, staging into uh, uh, one, two, three stages and depend on the serum creatinine and urine output. Uh, they are diagnosing and uh, diagnosing of acute kidney injury in Acute, um, uh, in, uh, acute and chronic liver failure patients, they are going very low for a low threshold to diagnose them early. Uh, so if there's a baseline uh, creatinine increase in by 1.5 to uh, uh, up to 1.9 or uh, the serum creatinine is more than 0.3 absolute rise from the baseline, uh, they are taking it as a stage one urine output if it is um, uh, less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for six hours then they are taking it as uh, stage two and so on uh, if you don't know the baseline value uh, we can uh, take roughly the serum creatinine more than 1.1 1 .1, uh, as the renal dysfunction if it is more than 1.5 as the renal failure so we are going for very low th threshold to diagnose renal uh, acute kidney injury in uh, this group of patients. Uh, so as we are running out of time, I'm not going to discuss uh, this uh, uh, in detail, but uh, we'll see what is hepatorenal syndrome uh, in, this uh, in this group of patients. So HRS AKI, uh, we are diagnosing uh, this in patient with uh, cirrhotic uh, with ascites and uh, going with, as I described earlier, the serum creatinine dynamic changes. Uh, if you no know, response to diuretic with uh, withdrawal and two day of uh, fluid challenge with 20% albumin uh, in the absence of structural kidney disease or shock, uh, we are diagnosing them as having hepatorenal syndrome. Um, and uh, we, uh, we should make sure that uh, they are not been on uh, uh, nephrotoxic drugs recently or currently. Then hepatic encephalopathy, as for any other patient, same uh, uh, grading uh, they are talking about, and I'm not going to in detail to that. Uh, anyway, grade one and two, they are considering as cerebral dysfunction, grade three and four as cerebral failure. So here also, we are management is also same, uh, which uh, the Dilini uh, went into detail. So this is this once again, uh, the, all the patients, when we are diagnosing as having acute or chronic liver failure, we have to prognostify them and uh, decide the disease severity. So as she uh, correctly pointed out earlier in detail, so we are going with the ARC score and the grading. And uh, if the score is less than 10, the chance of survival is high. If the uh, grade is more than 10, uh, the, their prognosis is going to be bad, so we have to select them properly and list for early liver uh, transplant. And this is same the algorithm what she has been discussing. 
Uh, so, uh, in uh, summarizing the management of acute or chronic liver failure, it's very important to uh, go through this timeline, uh, time frame for the management. Uh, first two weeks, we have to look actively uh, um, uh, find out uh, whether the patient has gone into systemic inflammatory response or sepsis and uh, AKI. And um, specific therapy is uh, uh, if we have identified the uh, acute uh, insult, uh, then uh, when if there if there's a uh, definitive treatment, we can consider that. Uh, then uh, otherwise support uh, support for the failing organs. Uh, then uh, in between we can give as she described the bridging therapy, uh, and definitive th uh, treatment is with liver transplant. Uh, there are imaging and experimental therapies as well. So we will uh, quickly uh, go through the support uh, for the failing organs. Uh, here, uh, the, we have to actively, uh, routinely do the inflammatory uh, markers and do the blood cultures, fluid cul um, body fluid cultures and look for the uh, having any infection. So uh, uh, we can start them with uh, prophylactically uh, broad spectrum antibiotic while we are waiting for the uh, investigations. Then coming into the uh, acute kidney injury, uh, if, the, uh, if they are having early acute uh, kidney injury, even stage one, uh, uh, we are supposed to treat for them with using 20% uh, albumin, one gram per kg for 48 hours. And if we have diagnosed hepatorenal syndrome, we can combine 20% uh, albumin with uh, litrazine. Uh, boluses or even infusion, we should make sure that we are not prescribing them with nephrotoxic drugs. Uh, then coming into lungs, here actually what we are uh, talking is hepatic encephalitis patients who are in grade 3 and 4, we have to uh, intubate them electively uh, uh, to protect their lungs. So they are, these patients are prone for stress ulcers, they, they, so we can use uh, prophylactic uh, against stress ulcers as well. The nervous system, it's the form of hepatic encephalopathy. As general, uh, in other patients, as in other patients, we can manage them uh, uh, to uh, uh, managing the precipitating force as well as uh, eliminating uh, elevated ammonia using lactulose, rifaximine, or metronidazole. And we should make sure that we are not using long acting sedatives. Then coagulopathy, uh, unless patient is having uh, active bleeding, we should not try to correct uh, INR routinely. Uh, and hemodynamics is very important. From the beginning, we should try to maintain their mean arterial pressure above 65. Then we, uh, for that, we can use uh, fluid challenges using 5% albumin or crystalloid. And other than that, if we are uh, going for uh, large volume parasynthesis, so if the patient is in bacterial, uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis or acute kidney injury, we can use uh, albumin, high percentage albumin as well. So if the uh, um, shock is refractory, we can consider even hydrocortisone, uh, intravenous hydrocortisone. Uh, this coming to the end, and I would like to highlight the fact that acute and chronic liver failure is a condition with very high short term mortality, even in base centers in the West. And diagnosis and treatment is a challenge. Uh, uh, ideally, we should uh, try uh, to manage patients with multidisciplinary approach and appropriate uh, supportive management. And most importantly, if we could uh, prevent uh, patients going into acute on chronic liver failure is the best thing because of the short, uh, high uh, short term short term uh, mortality uh, for this we can uh, 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 offer them uh, counseling for uh, alcohol because alcohol uh, will be the cause for even chronic liver disease as well as the acute insult and uh, most importantly uh, as uh, medical people when we are prescribing uh, hepatotoxic drugs uh, to this sort of patients we have to think twice we should um, uh, use them only if it is clearly indicated and minimum necessary uh, drug doses thank you thank you dr Archie, for your very comprehensive and informative presentation we'll be now moving to the final part of 
this clinical meeting. That's a picture side presentation by uh, Dr. Thiril Nikariwasam, who is senior registrar in medicine. Let me share some interesting word experience with you. They will appear as questions and you can think about them by yourself and then I will be discussing. So this is about a 33 year old female who presented to a medical casualty with progressive exertional shortness of breath with multiple joint pains and her full blood count revealed pancytopenia. And these lesions were seen in, on her face. I think you can see that these are uh, erythematous lesions with well-defined margins, and there is scaly plaques and also scarring and atrophy. So with the typical distribution, these are discoid lupus erythematosus. So with the given history of pancytopenia, multiple joint aches, uh, with further investigations, we were able to diagnose uh, systemic lupus erythematosus in her. So the next patient, he is a 75 year old man with multiple cardiovascular risk factors who presented with a chest pain, which lasted for about one hour. And this is his ECG. Hope you can see that there are uh, horizontal uh, ST depressions in the anterior leads V1 to V3, which are tall, with tall, broad R waves and also upright T waves. And the R wave in the V2 lead is very tall. So this is uh, suggestive of posterior myocardial infarction. Posterior myocardial infarctions are not well seen in the uh, 12 lead standard uh, ECGs. Therefore, we have to suspect with the above changes in the ECG. So in these patients, when we perform the ECG with posterior leads, it was evident that there is ST elevation in the posterior leads. When you guess it, you can invert the ECG and check for it, which will suggest posterior myocardial infarction. And this is the urine bag of a 48-year-old man who was bed-bound following spinal cord injury. And he presented to us with fever. And he was on a long-term cath indwelling catheter. I think you all uh, need to uh, recognize that there is purple discoloration in his urine. This is due to bacterial uh, action. Therefore, we can diagnose a urinary tract infection in him. This is called purple urine bag syndrome. And it is due to certain bacteria, such as uh, Klebsiella and Pseudomonas species, which convert a uh, chemical in the urine into red blue pigments. Then uh, the next patient is a 65 year old man who presented with mild abdominal pain and he claimed to have normal bowel habits and on examination the abdomen was soft and non tender and below given is his uh, chest radiograph. In the chest radiograph I think you can uh, identify the right hemidiaphragm is elevated and there is a bowel loop interposition in between the diaphragm and the liver. So this is called chylidity syndrome where which is a very rare condition and this the pain is due to the transposition of a bowel loop in between the diaphragm and the liver. Usually this is the transverse colon. And if the patient is uh, asymptomatic, it is called chylidity sign. Uh, these are the hands of an 55-year-old uh, patient who was treated for unstable angina. She was asymptomatic with these hands. And I think you can notice the herbal nodes here. So this is osteoarthritis of the hands. It usually occurs in women and often starts around the time of menopause. And it usually affects the base of the thumb and the distal interphalangeal joints, but uh, any other joint also can be affected. This is the uh, non-contrast CT scan brain of a 62-year-old female who presented with dementia and a tremor. Uh, I think you can see that there are widespread hyperdensity with this hyperdensities within the brain matter. So it was diagnosed as FAST syndrome. This is a rare condition which is inherited as autosomal dominant 
and it is caused by abnormal deposits of calcium in areas of brain, including the basal ganglia. That is why she has dementia and uh, movement disorder. Uh, this is a 64-year-old patient who was recently commenced on follow-up at a nephrology clinic, and he, she presented with soreness in her mouth. So by the appearance, it is Stephen Johnson syndrome, and most probably since she was started on a renal follow-up recently, allopurinol would have caused this. And this Stephen Johnson syndrome is a type 4 uh, hypersensitivity reaction, and it typically involves the skin and the mucous membranes. The classification is based on the uh, amount of uh, body surface area involvement. Uh, this is a picture of a hand of a 17-year-old girl who presented with fever and severe constitutional symptoms which were lasting for about one week. And these lesions were neither palpable nor tender. So it is, uh, they are genuine lesions and if, I to talk, if I'm to talk about other peripheral stigma of infective endocarditis, there are subungual uh, hemorrhages and oscillar nodes, which are tender subcutaneous nodules, usually found on the distal pads of the digits. And genital lesions are non tender and they are macular lesions on the palms and sores. Rot spots are retinal hemorrhages with small, clear centers, and they are rare. And the, the same patient she developed later some digital gangrene as well. So later when uh, these are the splinter hemorrhages which were seen in her. And later in the echocardiography, there was a large vegetation attached to the posterior cusp of the mitral valve. And in her blood culture, uh, Staphylococcus aureus was isolated. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, we come to the end of the three presentations. If the audience has any, have any questions, they can send in the chat or what they can do is uh, they can put their hands up in the raise hand feature for any clarifications. At the moment, we don't have any clarifications from the online audience. Um, if the in-person audience, if you have any clarifications, we can ask from the resource persons. Looks like there are no clarifications coming from the either online or uh, in-person audience. If the resource persons, if, if you want to make any final remarks, you are welcome to do so. No clear any comments to be made? Yeah, whole purpose of today's presentation is to make awareness uh, among our colleagues uh, about this acute on chronic liver failure concept because uh, what we uh, used uh, so far is when we are getting a patient with cirrhosis just uh, manage them conservatively uh, uh, thinking that it is only the decompensation and but now the, our facilities have improved and we are having this liver transplantation um, facility as well available in Sri Lanka so we have to actively look into this and uh, uh, do appropriate early uh, diagnosis and uh, early supportive management and as uh, how we have improved the renal transplant uh, try and help these patients who are coming with chronic liver failure as well uh, so I think this uh, would be an eye-opener for all of us uh, to think more uh, in detail, rationally, uh, uh, and with sympathetic, uh, sympathetically to the patients who are coming with even alcoholic cirrhosis. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, I think uh, early also I was thinking uh, my daughter, Vidhuni Patirna, she was giving me a hard, uh, uh, she had a hard time uh, to help me in, uh, technically. So. I, if I don't thank her in this forum, it will be a, a bit uh, something I have left behind. So uh, I would uh, like to thank her for giving me the technical support. Thanks. There is one question coming from the chat. Maybe you can stay for a while. Uh, the question is about what are the landmark trials in your failure? It's a very broad question. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. a broad question and um, uh, offhand it's very difficult for me to give a clear answer but uh, uh, there, there are so many uh, Asian as well as uh, the European countries, uh, uh, the, uh, the studies they have done a lot and uh, 
collectively they have uh, given these guidelines, uh, European guidelines separately and the Asia Pacific guidelines. Uh, it's uh, with the uh, research consortium uh, through that only they are uh, after coming into a consensus. Uh, two groups have given their own uh, different uh, uh, management plan. Thank you. And uh, with that, we come to the end of uh, this monthly clinical meeting and also uh, we'll be concluding all the clinical meetings for this year as well. Uh, so I thank the Ceylon College of Physicians and the three resource persons led by Dr. Ganesh Ali and Arachi and other two resource persons. And uh, let me invite all the resource persons on stage to show the appreciation of SLA in the customer review. With that, we are concluding the clinical meeting. The recorded session will be available in the SLMA social media and the YouTube for you to follow. Thank you.